Hey, thanks for stopping by. If this is your first time here, Atelunacy is a pop culture podcast where we evaluate what African movies and TV shows show and tell us about society. The themes we commonly touch on are race, class, gender, and sexuality, all through a social justice lens. We pick out a movie or TV show that I enjoyed watching, and each week we cover a different theme before moving on to the next show. Currently, we're looking at drum rolls. Namaste Wahala. Namaste Wahala is a Nigerian romantic comedy that was released in 2021. It's the story of Chidima, aka Didi, and Raj. Didi is a Nigerian lawyer, and Raj is an Indian investment banker or some money type thing like that. They meet in the cheesiest way you ever saw, fall in love, their parents crump their server saying, hell no, they fight, break up, cue a heartbreak montage to have all the best of them. Then sufficient time passes, things happen and they make up, hello, happily ever after, yay. Namaste Wahala will be a six part review. The six key themes we'll look at are one, fat girls and sex. Two, capitalism and relationships, black tax in particular. Three, capitalism and relationships on succession in particular. Four, gender and housework. Five, violence against women. And six, relationships, love and romance. Hope you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed making it. One of the things I'm interested in examining is the effect that capitalism and capitalist logic has on relationships. On the one hand, you have Didi's father's obsession with the succession of his law firm, rich people problems. And then there's Ima, who is Raj's Nigerian friend and whose family is financially dependent on him, which is the poor people problems side of it. For now, let's talk about Ima and his poor people problems. Ima is Raj's next door neighbor in the apartment complex they live in on Victoria Island, which is one of the wealthiest areas in Nigeria. It's not explicitly said that he lives next door, but when Raj's mother visits, Ima comes knocking after smelling the good food from across the hall. So if our boy can afford to live on Victoria Island next door to a successful Indian investment banker, we can assume he must be doing pretty well for himself, all right? He's okay, or at least okay adjacent. One of the only personal things we know about Iman is that his family is financially dependent on him, and he doesn't like it one bit. The argument can even be made that he doesn't like them. They are a fundraiser for an NGO that helps women dealing with issues like abuse. Ima refers to it as an event, and Raj calls it a party. Don't worry, we're going to talk about this film's poor handling of the violence against women storyline extensively. Raj is on the phone with his mother who calls him all the time. When he hangs up, Ima asks him, what's up with that? Raj says it's the price he pays for being an only child. And this is the opening Ima has been waiting for. He tells Raj how lucky he is to be an only child, how he is constantly bombarded with calls from his blood-sucking siblings, talking about, Brother Ima, we need money for school fees, and Brother Ima, the landlord has called. Raj is justifiably taken aback by the whole his siblings are bloodsuckers thing, but the film glosses over it, and we move on. I'm convinced that the reason Ima says it's his siblings who are bloodsuckers is because there's a societal expectation to help your parents but not so much your siblings. You can bitch about helping your parents, but there's an underlying expectation that you do it anyway and not call them bloodsuckers while doing it. After all, your siblings, it is assumed, had the same opportunities you did. And if you have made something of yourself, what's their excuse, huh? 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 You know, same parents, same social class, same 24 hours in a day. The argument can be made that you owe your parents for the numerous sacrifices they made to get you where you're at. But none can be made for owing your siblings, ergo siblings, bloodsuckers. In a conversation that you can find online between James Baldwin and Nikki Giovanni, something similar comes up. James Baldwin talks about coming close to getting married, but not doing it because it would have been irresponsible. It would have been irresponsible because he had his siblings to support. They were seven or eight siblings, and he had no stable source of income to speak of. He would not have been able to support his siblings, then add a wife, and his own children to that. When he tells Nikki Giovanni that, she says those were his father's children, not his. Jim says that's immaterial. His father was dead, and so they were his responsibility. They were his children. I quite agree with you, but this is something we have to confront. When I was 22, I was, like, I was about to get married. And for several reasons, I threw my wedding rings in the river, and that was when I split. You know, decided I would leave. I didn't get married partly because I, just, I partly because partly because I had no future. 
It's very, very important. You had you no know. future. I had no right, future. Sure. At, <laughs> no, you got to go back to where I was. Yeah, 22. You know, okay. I had no future. I, I couldn't keep a job. No, because I couldn't stand the people I was working for. And there wasn't a, I couldn't, nobody could call me a nigger. It's not a small, no. Yeah, little No. <laughs> so I split, you know. Now, I love that girl, and I wanted children. But I already had eight, and they were all starving. Yeah. And from my point of view, it would have been an act of the most criminal irresponsibility to bring another mouth into the world which I could not feed. Yeah, but you see, those weren't your children. Those were your father's children. My father was dead. That's not the And point. as far as they knew, then... That's not the point. You, you, one cannot, and I'm not knocking I'm not, your I'm, life, you know I'm what not, I mean? I'm not, I could, but one cannot be responsible for what one has I not I said we are not being rational. But I said we must. I mean, that's no, no, no. my quarrel with no, no, no. We my, must become my, rational. My, those are my brothers and sisters. They were your brothers rational and sisters. Or not. They were but starving. they were your father's children but they, and your mother's children. That was my father's responsibility. As far as I was concerned, they belong to me. Nikki shows this widespread belief that your siblings are not your responsibility. Not really. James Baldwin's position is obviously the one I gravitate toward. We owe each other, we just do. James Baldwin's problem and Ema's problem is that of black tax. Black tax is a term that originated in South Africa and that refers to the extra money that black professionals are expected to send every month to support their less fortunate nuclear and extended families. It's all those sacrifices, financial and otherwise, that black people have to make to support their less fortunate relatives. One of my biggest problems with the way black tax is framed and the way Ima uses it is the way it lays the blame on poor black people. Poor, vulnerable black people are blamed when it is they who are the victims of a system set up to keep them down and keep them poor. He calls his siblings bloodsuckers, and why? They call him to ask him, beg really, for money to pay school fees and rent. Nothing fancy, just the basics. Are there people who take advantage of the fact that their siblings have made it and are willing to support them? Doubtless they are. This is the case for one of the ladies in the film, The Smart Money Woman, also from Nigeria. That's not the case here. And I think that people in need of genuine help far exceed those who deliberately take advantage of their relatives. This, this is reminiscent of America and the welfare queens thing. It just, it really reeks of that. Let me see if I can remember what the whole welfare queens thing was about. Um, it was founded on this racist notion that black women were taking social security and then just really living it up on that money, right? Like they were purposefully not working so that they could just get the money and then just like you know buy designer shit and just like live their best lives on welfare on the dime of hard-working americans and that was never the case number one more there were more poor white people on welfare and number two the people on welfare were truly poor people and and we mean people who were really destitute people in a bad way they're not people who are taking advantage of a system. And this is the same logic that's being used here in relation to people who are being supported by their families. There's this consistent effort to make it seem like they're just taking advantage of people. They're just refusing to work so that they can, you know, leech on their relatives. You know, like Ima and his alleged blood-sucking siblings, and that's not the case. For the most part, people who need help from their relatives or people who are really struggling. I mean, it's just interesting to me how this sort of logic of demonizing poor people finds its way everywhere. It just, it finds its way. Majority of these people are in terrible social and economic positions. And in true capitalist logic, somehow it's their fault that they need help and are burdening us with it. People who need our help are not exploiting us. If there's something actively causing us harm, it's the system, not them. Whatever has made them dependent on us is the problem, not their dependence on us. African culture is by its nature social and communal. Supporting each other is a significant chunk of our philosophy. So this idea of viewing helping each other as a tax and a burden is just so unfortunate. We help and support each other. It's what we do. We live with family members who need help and send money home and show up for each other in all the ways we can. 
How is this not a beautiful thing? How is this not revolutionary? Isn't this how we fight against a system that's constantly trying to kill us? Isn't this how we keep each other alive against all odds? There's a poem by Audre Lorde that Stacey and Chin performs beautifully, which says we were never meant to survive. And we weren't. We are not meant to survive. Giving to each other, supporting each other, fundraising for each other is how we ensure our survival in a system designed to kill us. My point is the issues are systemic, and I know we say this all the time for everything now, but maybe that's because it's true. The real problems, if we're interested in getting to the root of it, are capitalism, racism, sexism, colonialism, and other forms of imperialism and exploitation. The problem is inequality and all the systems that entrench it. The people who need our help are not the problem. And the fact that we help is also not the problem. The problem is the larger factors at play that have put those people in a position where they have to rely on our kindness to survive. It's true that this issue disproportionately affects black people wherever they are. It's true that it sets black people back. It's true that it's a burden of sorts on the people financially supporting their families. It's even true that those black people may not reach the same level of financial security as people of other races in a similar income bracket. Yes, all black people would fare better in a society in which people's needs are met. The idea here is not to diminish the pressure that the people supporting their families are under. It's just to point out that the people who are suffering are not our enemies. They are not the problem. They are in fact the victims. You may be a victim as well, but if there was victim Olympics, the people who need your help to survive would win. It's just crazy how they're the ones in a vulnerable situation and some of the focus is on the people who are doing better financially. Full disclosure, I struggled both sides of the black tax thing. I'll send a little money home and sometimes someone, my mom, sends money and food stuff to me. My mom is great. When it comes to this, it never feels like, ooh, like you're draining me. You're a blood sucker. It just feels like you're all loving, you know? How you doing? Here's so much, right? Here's so many. Like, that's what it is. It's never, it never feels like, you know, you need to be working hard so that, like, I don't have to do these things. So I'm not forced to do these things or I don't feel the need to do these things. It's never that. It's just, you know, I'm thinking about your love here. Is like I'm sending some beans over, I'm sending some money over. And I don't know if you have ever. So, this is not my mom, my mom is great. But if you have ever been on the wrong side of that arrangement where it feels like you're setting that person back, right? Where it feels like you're a burden to them. There's no worse feeling than that. I don't know that there's a worse feeling than that. Than being in a vulnerable place financially and then having somebody else make you feel like, like you're a burden. It's, it's insane. It's crazy. Um, I do this with other people too, right? Um, other people who are not family members, like I'll send them something. Sometimes they ask me, often they ask me, um, often they ask me, I'll, I'll send them something, right? And I'll say this, any day, any time, I'd rather be the one sending remittances than the one on the other end of that call, trying to find the language to ask for help. One more time, having gathered all my courage to make that single call. Any day, any day. I'd rather be the one whose blood is being actively sucked than the one constantly exposing my poverty and lack, hoping this other person considers me worthy of helping. I think that people like Emma forget that they are in a far better position than their relatives who call asking for money to pay rent or something. If you're Emma, you can say no. I don't have anything now. Or just no. And not even follow up with a reason, honest or made up. You have the power. And if you've ever had to beg for money or been dependent on someone else for life's necessities, you know which one is the better option to be in. You know. Emma, in this film, lives on Victoria Island, one of the wealthiest areas in Nigeria. 
and the film wants us to identify with him and feel sorry for him for having to deal with his blood-sucking relatives. On African soil, where each paycheck supports more than an individual's immediate family, these people want us to view his siblings as the problem. They want us to vilify them and view him as the true victim, sight unseen. Here, where we live, face to face with poverty, and majority of us are one small financial emergency away from being the ones making those phone calls. They want us to demonize the siblings. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's a big ask. I think a lot about how family relationship dynamics are shaped by money. How when you're the one financially supporting the family, no one can tell you boo. And what you say goes. You're a god, sometimes even to your parents. Which is to say you have no genuine, equal, comradely relationship with anyone in your family. There's no way. Ima has a good relationship with his siblings. I can't see it. How can you have a good relationship with someone you publicly refer to as a blood sucker? If you're the recipient, nobody cares about what you have to say. You're a dependent in a subservient position. You're no different from a child in a society that does not listen to children. Which is to say you have no genuine, equal, comradely relationship with a person who supports you and sometimes other family members. I think that the only way to have a genuine relationship of equals is either to be friends with people of comparative wealth or those with similar politics. Even with family, I think the relationship only stands a chance if you guys are at the same relative level of wealth or share the same politics or worldview. If one of you is the personal responsibility, work hard to achieve the life you want type, and the other thinks that it's the systems that are keeping people poor and not laziness, Y'all better just have the same amount of money so that none is dependent on the other. Picture this, you, critical of capitalism type, being financially dependent on an all-you-need-to-do-is-get-up-and-work-hard type. Fish, what are the chances you have a genuine, equal, comradely relationship? I'm betting slim to none. Now, if y'all's wealth was similar and none of you was dependent on the other, the relationship might stand a chance. The only way I think there is to have a genuine, comradely relationship if y'all's wealth isn't close is to have the same politics. If both of y'all are critical of the system and one of you is dependent on the other, that relationship at least stands a chance. The similar worldview anchors the relationship. In one instance, the foundation is similar wealth, and in the other, the foundation is similar politics. Either way, y'all's relationship needs a similar foundation to survive. Back to Emma. Emma's solution to the problem he finds himself in is to hustle harder with hopes of catching a big break. It's really confusing because the film makes it seem like Ima's struggling, yet he lives on Victoria Island. It's, it's really quite the conundrum. Anyway, that's Ima's solution. Hustle harder. It makes sense. And in the end, in true capitalist propaganda fashion, he gets some kind of deal and secures the bag. We literally see him at an ATM, withdrawing cash, then celebrating with Raj. It's important to push that message, especially for the blood-sucking siblings out there. Just get the fuck up and work hard. Hustle, damn it! The film really asks us to suspend a lot of disbelief here. All this guy has, in his own words, is a demo in one hand and a business plan in the other. I guess, you know, and some hustle in him. And by the end of the film, he's bawling. That is nothing like real life. Not in real life I've seen anyway. This hustle had a solution. I like putting band-aid on a gaping chainsaw wound. It helps. I'm sure it helped him. But it's just not efficient or effective on a large scale. It fits in with capitalism's personal responsibility individualistic framework where everyone solves their problem on their own. When historically, the masses have solved their problems collectively. We have to see that we have a common problem. And that is a system that prioritizes profit and domination over life. Capitalism is terrible for human relationships. Everyone loses. All of nature, including people, animals, land, the atmosphere, no one wins in a system that centers profit over life giving and sustenance. Helping each other is an act of resistance. Caring for each other and sustaining each other is an act of resistance. It is life giving in a system that profits from death and destruction. We have to identify the real black tax. It's the systemic issues. 
the way our labor is exploited and our resources pillaged by imperialists and their local cronies. It's the way corporations and groups like the IMF actively work to enslave black and brown people. Rather than pathologize and frame poor black people as exploitative, what we need to do is politicize the matter. This is said all the time, and it's because it's true. We have to learn to organize and build solidarity between those who have been lucky enough to make it and those who are in the trenches barely surviving. We have to organize with a singular cause the creation of systems that center communal life and well-being over capitalist ideals like individualism and accumulation of wealth at all costs. And remember, if you're Ima in your family, among your siblings, you're the lucky one. Don't punch down. Let's close with Eugene Debs' powerful words of solidarity. This was his statement to the court when he was sent to prison for speaking out against World War I. He said, Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the minister on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. This solidarity. We're together in this. Together is how we survive. Let's remember that. All right, that does it with um, poor people problems. Let's do rich people problems. So exotic and fun. Diddy's father runs a successful law firm. And he wants him a successor, preferably one with a penis, who is, I guess, going to secure his legacy with it. Didi is apparently complicating these succession plans by living her own life. While they're having breakfast on the morning that Raj and Didi meet, her father laments about Didi's absence from the farm in favor of working at the NGO. They're celebrating some big win, and Didi wasn't part of it. He turns to her and says, you should have been a part of it from the beginning. Instead, you were sidetracked by your hobby. He follows that comment with something about how her and Somto, the lawyer from his law firm currently having breakfast with them, would make a good couple. Didi, smart girl that she is, ignores them and starts serving herself breakfast. The job her father is dismissively referring to as a hobby that sidetracked her from focusing on important things at the farm is an NGO that works with women in crisis, dealing with things like sexual abuse, violence, and assault. So, you know, unimportant hobby stuff. One of the key storylines in the film is Didi and the Indian lady from the NGO, Lila, offering legal representation to a woman who was physically assaulted by the son of a wealthy Nigerian man. This kind of work is what he derisively refers to as a distracting hobby. Part of what is truly revealing is the fact that Didi started working at the NGO as part of her father's law firm's annual CSR activity. Her father goes on whining about Didi's choices when some to the preferred penal, though is it penist, successor jumps in in a misguided attempt to calm his boss down to defend Didi and I guess score some favor. He says, I think she understands that it's just a CSR project that continues to keep the company in very positive light. It's almost like companies don't truly really care about the CSR activities they append their names to. His statement and the way it is received without contest tells you everything you need to know about companies and CSR. Her father dismisses her work for two key reasons. One, it's not in keeping with the legacy and succession of the family law firm. And two, it's not the prestigious money maker that the firm is. It's not a career, he insists. The dismissal of her work causes significant tension between father and daughter, and at some point, she even leaves home. He calls it a hobby, to suggest that it's some kind of waste of time, which in a capitalist society, I suppose it is. It's this idea that things only matter, things only have value, if the marketplace determines that they have value. 
This is why people are continually urged to monetize their hobbies because that's the only time an activity becomes worth pursuing. So this man dismisses the important work his daughter is involved in and this causes a serious rift between them. Another aspect of their relationship that stood out for me is that he pushes her towards a relationship with Somto because, well, he has a penis and he's a good enough lawyer to hand over the law firm to. He doesn't take a single minute to think about whether his daughter likes Somto or not. All that matters to him is securing the cash cow he's built and making sure it goes into the hands of the right penis person. How can a man who we are encouraged to believe is a good man and a good father act in a way in which his primary concern is not his child's happiness and well-being, but securing his cash cow? How is this a good man, a good parent? How is marriage in the 21st century something you do for your parents? He literally says she should give them a son-in-law like she owes them that. Do it. I believe as human beings, we owe each other a lot. But you cannot convince me that there is a universe in which we owe our parents a spouse. Jesus Christ. It's also just an interesting reminder about the history and the roots of marriage. It was, first of all, about getting a wife, which is free labor in the home and the farm. Farm FARM and farm FIRM. And then it was about getting children, more free labor, and finally about making sure those children were only from your sperm so that they can be legitimate heirs of your accumulated wealth. It's always good to be reminded that marriage wasn't about love and companionship, and that even now it's about a lot more than just love. In this case, marriage is about succession. Because it's not enough to be someone's legitimate heir, you must also have a penis or be legally able to join yourself to one, thus being as a result of said joining a legal holder of a penis or penis adjacent. I don't understand rich people because, well, I'm not rich. And this failure to understand them is likely also the reason why I'm not going to be rich. I don't understand why you would want to box your child into anything. The whole thing about money is it gives you freedom to do shit without the shackles of worrying about how you will keep yourself and those you love alive. I would imagine if you're proper rich, it shouldn't bother you whether your child is engaged in activities that generate money or not. Let me speak for myself. If I was stupid rich, as long as my kid wasn't on some destructive path, I'd be cool with them doing whatever. You want to spend your days painting clouds? Do that. Traveling to exotic places? Yes. Smoking weed and playing in a garage band? By all means. Reviewing random African movies online? Psh, okay. If that's the choice you're making. But that's just me. I cannot fathom why I would want my kid in the hassle when they have a way out. Freedom. This is the point of crazy money, especially when you have a cash cow, in this case in the form of a law firm. Hire competent people to run it or sell it when you can no longer run it yourself. But don't force your kid into the straight jacket that is living your life. I think that part of the reason for this insistence that did he go back to the firm to work and care for it is to further the capitalist propaganda that wealthy people are wealthy because they work hard. With my fictitious kids globe trotting, smoking weed, and just living their best lives, there's no way to make an argument that they're living that life because they work hard. It's obviously not the case. So for rich people with firms and corporations that exploit other people's labor, then accumulate that wealth for themselves and their progeny, it's very important to keep in place that narrative that they work hard for their shit and their kids too and their grandchildren who inherit it after them and so on. Primo and Sonto are two of the law firm's employees that we're shown. It's implied that they are among the best workers at the firm. Both of them must have been heavily involved in brokering the deal Didi's father was being congratulated for. Yet it's safe to assume that all they got for their trouble is likely just their salaries and maybe a bonus. Primo, in fact, spoiler alert, gets fired later on in the film. This is what being a worker looks like. The boss keeps all or at least majority of the proceeds of your labor. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, his daughter, who did nothing towards the success of the farm, casually gets to inherit it. This is why workers should own the companies they work for. Anyway, back to succession. While they're having lunch, Raj's Indian mother confronts Didi's father about needing to leave the law firm to a man when Didi's already a great lawyer. 
In what is I'm guessing supposed to be victory for women, hashtag girl boss feminism, Didi's father concedes that a penis isn't necessarily a prerequisite for inheritance. Even though Didi has shown no interest in running the farm, she is inexplicably happy about her father's sudden willingness to entrust it to her. So you have Primo, a cutthroat lawyer, who appears to live for the job and has been an asset to the farm, getting fired, while Didi just gets to inherit the shit that she hasn't worked to build at all. I'm guessing this is why Karl Marx and Engels were against private property and this type of wealth accumulation and inheritance. Anywho, don't marry for your parents. If your father's like Didi's dad, with your chest, tell him I told you to tell him. If you want a man to take over your legacy and accumulated wealth so bad, go out and find one yourself. You're a big boy, you can do it. Until next time, girl. Remember who you are. Love life. Love people. Stay long.